I'm John Batchelor. Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, is here. And Mary has a very sweet spot for Australia. So I pay a deal of attention during the week for Australian news. We call there often. However, the last week, it's been impossible to ignore Australian news because now we in New York have connected with it. Uh, suddenly, the threat to New York by the new Prime Minister of Iraq, a terror threat against our subways, connects exactly with the police action uh, some days ago in Brisbane and Sydney, two large cities that aren't very far apart, I take it. And They're somewhat far apart. But the simultaneity of the rest, arrests or detentions included 800 police and statements that are still hard to believe of a plot by... Islamic State affiliated Australians and others to kidnap, to abduct a random Australian citizen and behead such a person with video in order to terrify the whole state. Since then, there have been other revelations, so we're very pleased to welcome John Roscombe, the Institute of Public Affairs in Melbourne, because the, the events of this last week have pushed Australia to the fore of fighting or resisting the threat of the Islamic State. John, a very good morning to you. The plot was fantastic and since then you have watched your prime minister who is making uh, remarks about terror in the United Nations but also the governance of Australia move suddenly to aggression and uh, pr- defense against the terror threat was Australia was Australia unaware or unready for this John did this surprise the public of th- this threat good morning to you Hello, John. Hello, Mary. Yes, John, this question of the threat of terror has really borne fruit in Australia over the last couple of months. Um, The big thing that changed the attitude of Australians uh, to this question was what we call here in Australia foreign fighters travelling to the Middle East and appearing to fight with ISIS. And it now appears that uh, there could be up to three or four dozen Australians fighting in the Middle East. Now, that's a small number compared to perhaps the Americans or Europeans there. Uh, But Australians had, I think, thought we were immune. Uh, Then, over the last few months, we've had uh, intelligence advice that um, a number of these people are likely to come back to Australia with an intent to do us harm. And, John, what changed the entire debate in Australia um, was the picture on the front page of Australia's newspapers of, I think it was a seven-year-old holding up a severed head. Now, from all of that, these things have flown. Um, And then on on Tuesday evening here in Melbourne, from where I'm speaking to you, um, we had an incident of it appears to be a young man going to a police station with an ISIS flag and knives. Uh, to to attack policemen, uh, he he attacked them. Uh, he stabbed them, right, hospital. John? He stabbed them, uh, and the young man was shot dead. So, in the course of a few months, the entire political landscape in Australia has changed. Now, uh, aside from that uh, event in in Melbourne, John, uh, I, I also note an attack on a police officer in the western suburbs of Sydney. Uh, where a, a defense force official was assaulted by uh, two men of, uh, as the news has put it, Middle Eastern appearance. Um, is this blowback from the Muslim community? Uh, how, how has this terror alert been received in those neighborhoods? Well, uh, Mary, as you might imagine, um, uh, there's been a mixed response. Um, I would argue that responsible community leaders have uh, explained that uh, uh, these terror laws Uh, These criminal laws are not aimed at any one group of any particular religion. Uh, It applies to all Australians. Uh, Unfortunately, there is a small group of leaders uh, and also the socialist alternative here in Australia that has claimed this is part of a plot of the West against everyone else. And at the moment, fortunately, they've been ignored, um, but there certainly is an undercurrent that um, the police are picking on us. And I just did an interview here with Australian media pointing out um, that the police were not picking on uh, this young man who went to a police station with knives 
and an ISIS flag. That is not a confection of the government. It is not a confection of multinational corporations aiming to make money out of the war in the Middle East. Uh, that is the reality. How's the Prime Minister doing with this? Uh, he was very much in the news when the first uh, police raids went out. Has he been standing up to questions? You have a different governance, so it's not the same as a president. That's right. Well, the, the Prime Minister gets to be questioned on the floor of the Parliament, uh, and the Prime Minister has done very well. Tony Abbott uh, has, I think, struck the balance between freedom and security to a large extent. As we have spoken about before, unfortunately, um, the Prime Minister said that in an effort to keep the Muslim communities on side, he would not repeal a law that before the election he promised to repeal, which was to uh, uh, make it, which makes it an offence to insult or offend someone on the basis of their race. Um, but there are now broader questions being raised as to whether uh, some of the new counter-terrorism legislation he's introducing perhaps might even go too far. Now, John, th- I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, this anti-terror legislation, we saw a wave of that after 9-11 and the Bali bombings that killed 88 Australians. Um, what do these new laws uh, uh, aim to achieve? Well, that's a very good question, Mary, and the Prime Minister has said broadly um, these new laws are designed to take account of technological developments and the fact that so much happens over the internet. Um, and that is certainly true. But um, I and many other people are are concerned that at the moment it appears the government has not completely made the case as to why um, a whole new raft of laws is is necessary. Um, after these terror swoops in Brisbane and Sydney, and, and John, I can tell you that Brisbane and Sydney are about a thousand kilometres apart here in Australia. Um, after those terror swoops, um, a number of people uh, were were detained, and here in Australia you can be detained uh, for up to, I think it is, two weeks um, without uh, being charged. Now, this is a very strong power of the state, of the government, and uh, uh, the Abbott government is looking at extending that power. Uh, the Abbott government is looking at extending the power of the intelligence agencies to track uh, what we say on the in- internet. Uh, initially, they had spoken about uh, tracking and keeping uh, a record of every single Australian's internet search history. Now, they've backed off of that, um, but the concern of many Australians is that in the midst of um, uh, these very serious threats and these actual attacks, we are going to be rushing through legislation that is going to stay on the statute books for many years. I'm going to push back on you a little bit here, John, because dealing with terrorists is not like dealing with criminals. Criminals, you want to gather evidence and then try them in a court and put them in jail. But with terrorists, you want to keep them and interrogate them with a completely different goal to prevent future attacks. Um, Is there a risk here that that Abbott's anti-terror laws are being misconstrued because they're being compared to laws meant for for, for domestic criminals? Oh, yes, Mary, and you raise an important point, that you're exactly right. These are laws designed to stop attacks. But at the same time, uh, the definition of terrorism in Australian law is now potentially so wide that if, and I'll give you, this is a real life example, that if you argue Israel has the right to defend itself against rockets from Gaza, you could be construed as supporting terrorism because in some people's minds, sadly, Israel is a terrorist state. Now, that is of course not what I believe. Uh, Some people do believe that. And the problem that we have is some of these terrorism laws are drawn so widely that we are now we've now got laws not just to stop the threat of violence which is entirely appropriate but we have laws that say it is against the law to incite terrorism now that is such a vague term that potentially it could be used not just against people who intend to blow us up and behead us um, but but people in a range of other circumstances 
John, final question for you. Because this is new and we're getting used to it here in New York, I mean, the president starts bombing in Syria on Monday night and we're dealing with a terror threat on Thursday. So it's all in action. Was there a palpable change in the media after this attempt or the plot to kill an Australian beheading? Did people cringe and go in a new direction that you hadn't seen for many years? There is some of that new direction, but the re- the response of the Australian media has been has been twofold. From the left wing media and from the government owned ABC, um, they have basically ignored large aspects of this, and they have concentrated on the critiques of the police, and they've concentrated on the critique of some Muslim leaders that this is the police picking on us. Right. The rest of the mainstream media understand that there is a very uh, serious threat ahead. Uh, You're talking to me from Melbourne at the moment. Tomorrow is our Super Bowl day. It's the grand final (laughs) at the Melbourne Cricket Ground in the um, Australian Football League. More important Um, things here, John Batchelor. (laughs) Yes, I've been reading There'll be 100,000 people there, and and, and people are concerned there there might be an attack. So I think most Australians understand the change in the tenor, but sadly not all in the media do. John Roskam is the executive director of the Institute of Public Affairs in Melbourne, Mary Kissley, editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. I'm John Batchelor.